So last time we were talking about MSR scheme and renormalons, and so we talked about the MSBAR scheme, we talked about renormalons, and we said that we could introduce a mass scheme that has an arbitrary power law cutoff, which we called R, to distinguish it from mu, or lambda, or some other cutoff. And so the idea of this scheme right here was, was to have a nice way of perturbing away from pole mass to get rid of this renormalon problem that the pole mass has, but retain all the nice features of MS bar. And in particular, we don't really want to calculate anything new if we can avoid it. And that's what this scheme does, because really what it does is it uses the fact that we know that the conversion of the pole to MS bar scheme has this renormalon. So this series here has a renormalon, and it just takes that series over from MS bar, puts it in with a cutoff, which is this R, and defines a new mass scheme using that formula. Uh, so this is like a mass scheme that has an adjustable cutoff, which we can take to be at whatever scale we want. And in particular, in HQET, you'd want to take that R to be something like a GEV type scale, because that wouldn't spoil your power counting. So recall in HQET that this delta M should be, by power counting, a border lambda QCD. So Typically, you would take R somewhat greater than lambda QCD, but of order lambda QCD. OK, so now we have this extra cutoff. So when we have a cutoff, we have a renormalization group. And it, if you think about the renormalization group for the MS bar mass, it would be something like mu d by d mu of m of mu is equal to anomalous dimension times m of mu back again. This one's a little different. It's R d by dr of m of R. And then there's no m on the right-hand side. It's an additive renormalization to get rid of the renormalon. And there's a power also of R here. Okay, so it's not just, it's not just summing log, logs. It's all, it is summing some logs related to the running of alpha, but it's also got this power. And when you solve this anomalous dimension equation, which we talked about last time, you get an integral like this in this t variable. And at leading log order, it looks like this. Difference of two incomplete gamma functions. Because of the mass dimensions, it has to be made up by mass dimensions on the right-hand side. Coupling is dimensionless. The only thing that has dimensions is lambda QCD. And that's exactly what pops out of solving this equation. The R gets converted to a lambda QCD by this formula here. This G of T was just T at lowest order. So this is an all-order form here. And this is the leading log solution there. So if we look at that leading log, and what is the T0 and the T1, that's just the, the same formula here, but with alpha at R1 and R0, the, the boundary conditions. We want to run from R0 to R1, and this formula tells us how to do that. And we get re a result here that has the coupling at R0 and the coupling at R1. OK, so if we look at that result, it's interesting because if we just had one of these gamma functions, these incomplete gamma functions, then the, we would have a renormalon. And that's where I stopped last time. So just looking at this lambda QCD times gamma and expanding about the, uh, in a series at about 0, which is expanding in, in the coupling at infinity, uh, you get this series, which has a 2 to the n n factorial. It's an asymptotic series. This is a classic example of a function that has an asymptotic series, this incomplete gamma function. There's some exponential that combines together with the lambda QCD to give an r. So I've, I've pulled that out front, and then we have this series, which is exactly a u equals a half renormal on, and the u equals a half had to do with this power of 2 to the n here, the fact that it's 2 to the n and not some other number. But if we take the difference here, and this is what I said in words last time, but now I'll write it down in equations, if we take the difference there, that actually doesn't have this renormal on. So, This is the difference of two series, each of which is asymptotic. If we want to compare those series, we should expand them in the same coupling constant. So let me do that.
So if I take the difference of those two series, taking this using this formula, but now I re-expand all these alphas in terms of alphas at the, the R1 scale. So when they're at the R0 scale, I re-expand them in terms of alpha at the R1 scale. Do some rearranging, I can write the result in this form as this. So the key thing is that difference there. And if you thought of, think about what this sum here is, this is like kind of like an exponential, right? Something to a power, k factorial, except it's limited to n. So if I really went all the way up to n equals infinity, this would be just giving actually exponential of r1 over r0, it would cancel the r0 over r1, which would then cancel the 1. You could rearrange the series a little bit to make it more obvious that it's convergent. n factorial here, you might worry, well, this thing here has to fall fast enough to get rid of that n factorial. So write this thing out, this 1, as an infinite series of terms from 0 to infinity of the same form as this. And then what you're left with is the following thing. All the terms from 0 to n cancel, and then you're just left with the terms from n plus 1 to infinity. then you can see that the n factorial is being tamed by another factorial growth, which is always of a greater power, n plus 1. OK, so this is number less than 1. And this thing here, beta naught alpha over 2 pi times the log, is also something that's less than 1. It's, a, it's exactly the thing that you sum up when you're running the coupling. So this is a convergent series. Basically, the physics of it is we had this mass that didn't have a renormal on, but it had an arbitrary scale. And what the renormalization group allows us to do is move to another scale. When we move to another scale, it better be that we don't reintroduce the renormal on. And the fact that I can write this as a convergence series shows very explicitly that I'm not having that problem in the difference between these two. So it's renormal on free, and it remains renormal on free when we change the scale. And we can sum up these logarithms that have to do with changing the scale. So if you were, why would you care about that? Well, imagine that you extract this ma mass from some B physics. So you take an R that's of order of GeV. And then you say, well, that's a very precise number, but how do I use it for, say, LHC phenomenology? Well, if I want to connect it to LHC phenomenology, I probably want to convert it to the MS bar scheme. Because LHC is high energy. Maybe I'm doing Higgs to BB bar. BB bar very energetic. So we want to use the MS bar scheme. But I've got this mass at a very low scale. What you would want to do is you'd want to use the renormalization group, run it up to the mass scale MB, match, switch schemes from this scheme where you extracted the mass to MS bar, you'd get a correspondingly precise value of MS bar because the series between this mass and the MS bar mass is, a, again, a renormal on free series. And then you could take that mass at the MB scale, run it up to, say, the Higgs scale, and use it for phenomenology. So you always want to be able to go back and forth between schemes. And if different schemes have different scales associated to them, then you need the renormalization group to, in order to put them at the same scale when, where you want to do the conversion. OK, so that's why being able to sum up these logarithms without reintroducing any renormal on problems is, is important. And in general, if you were to try to do this with MS bar, um, it wouldn't work. Uh, You don't really have a, a way of treating the renormal on in, MS, in the MS bar scheme when you're talking about physics below the mass of the particle. OK, so we can generalize this little discussion here, which was a fixed order leading log discussion, 
And I can write down for you just how, what would happen if I were to formally integrate this integral here without making any expansion in alpha s, okay? So, so express gamma r of t as an infinite series, and it's an infinite series in alpha s. That means it's an infinite series in 1 over t. We had an expression for this capital G of t last time, which again was an infinite series. Just plug in those infinite series, do all the integrals. They all turned out to be incomplete gamma functions. OK, so we can make, write down a formula, which is an all order generalization of that result, just to see what happens at higher orders. So basically, we'd have something like what g of t was, we'd have something like this. And then all the rest of the terms we can expand out in a inverse Taylor, a Taylor series in 1 over t. OK, so I'm just, there's two terms in g of t I want to keep in the exponential. And then the rest of them I can expand out and combine with these terms. And that just gives me some series. And I can do these integrals. So. Writing the integrand out, we can just establish some notation for it. For that infinite series of 1 over t's, and we'll just call the coefficients sj. There's a 1 over t. There's the, yeah. So this gamma bar starts as a 1 over t. So really, I should have said that there's a 1 over t here. That's where this 1 over t came from. So then integrate that, and that gives us a generalization of this formula here where we say that m of r1 minus m of r0, which we work, where we work at some order in the resummation, which you would say is n to the k ll. So you have leading log, next leading log, next to next leading log, and then and when, you have n, when you have k of them, you say n k ll. And the solution of that equation would be the k order lambda qcd. series and instead of just the zero incomplete gamma function we get some slightly different one but it's got the same kind of structure where we get the difference of gamma functions S's are just whatever you get from the anomalous dimension. So kind of a simple notation. Et cetera. So they're just some combination of numbers. And the twiddles here is just my shorthand for accounting for a fact that there's a some beta knots floating around. Okay, so this is just algebra. And these B1 hats and B2 hats were things that showed up in the beta function of QCD, which we also talk, talked about last time. So we defined those last time. The B1 hat and B2 hat were just combinations of the beta, beta 1 and beta 2 and beta 0. Okay, so these are some numbers that you can calculate given the anomalous dimensions. Given those numbers, you can plug it into this formula, and then you have a 
generalization of the previous result. So whatever order you know the anomalous dimension to, you can use that solution. And we'll use it a little later when I talk about some numbers. All right, so any questions so far? There's a similar thing for MS bar mass. If you were summing logs of the MS bar mass, there's an all orders formula you could write down and use once you know the anomalous dimensions. You could find it in the particle data book, I think. All right, so just coming back to this comment about the fact that the anomalous dimension is Renormalon free. So the fact, the fact that the solution here was Renormalon free, that the difference here was Renormalon free, was because there was no Renormalon on the right hand side here, and that the anomalous dimension was Renormalon free. And it was constructed from something that had a Renormalon, which is this delta m. But it was a derivative of that delta m. And so the derivative kills the Renormalon. So this thing is free of the delta m of order lambda QCD Renormalon because that Renormalon is a constant. And when you take the derivative, you kill the constant. That's how you can think of it. If you start writing out the gamma functions, then you see that it looks like you're finding the Renormalon, but then there's some differences that show up and, and cancel it off. So the way that that works, it's kind of like this, where you see, sort of think that you have the Renormalon, but then you realize there's another term and it cancels it off. So if we, if we look back at our formula for delta m, this had an infinite series of a's. This was like a sum over some a n's and some alpha to the n, some other factors. And these gammas are just related to the a's. But they're not just related to the a's. They're also factors of the beta function that come in. So. Just to give you an idea, so once you know the scheme conversion to the scheme, then you know the anomalous dimension. And if you look at this series and you think about whether the series for the anomalous dimension is convergent or asymptotic, identify the pattern of how these coefficients look. And basically, if you, for example, look at the bubble sum, this a n plus 1 would be something that has an n factorial 2 beta naught to the n plus 1, oh, sorry, to the n growth. And then this thing here is n minus 1 factorial 2 beta naught to the n minus 1. And then there's this extra. 2n beta naught that multiplies it, and you can see that there, there's an exact cancellation. So that's how the bubble sum, you know, we, one way of probing the Renormalon is just to look at the bubble sum. And the bubble sum gave us a particular value of these a's, and you can see that the bubble sum Renormalon is canceling out between the terms here. Okay, so that's just a expression of what I said over here, but that's a kind of more definite expression of the fact that this thing is actually free of the Renormalon. So I'm going to put this aside for a minute, and we'll come back and use this formula a little later in today's lecture. Um, and I want to, so there's sort of two ways that you can use this technology. You can use it as a means of doing what I said, of connecting masses at different scales and doing phenomenology, and we'll come back to that a little bit later, but you could also use it as a probe of the Renormalon. So one thing that you might complain about with the bubble sum is that it's just some arbitrarily chosen way of probing the Renormalon, and maybe there's some problem where you don't have like fermions around, maybe you only have gluons, and there could still be a Renormalon in those problems. 
So how would you deal with that if you didn't have the light quarks available to make up this bubble sum? Or maybe there's some renormal on that just so happens you don't see it with the quarks. There's no guarantee of that. So you'd like to have some other mechanism for looking for renormalons, and you can actually use the renormalization group to do that, which is kind of interesting. So I'll show you how that works.